<clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Panian, for your introduction and for inviting me to um, conduct this workshop with you um, at the Central University of Kerala. It's really my great pleasure to um, be here and to have spent the last five days with the, the uh, workshop um, participants. It's, uh, I was just telling Dr. Panian that I can't believe that I squeezed uh, a semester's worth of work into one week. And uh, it's been quite intensive, but I do certainly appreciate the um, interactions I've had with uh, those of you who have um, uh, been part of this workshop. And uh, it's been uh, very stimulating for me to be in conversation with you. And I hope you feel the same way um, about having spent the last five days uh, with me as well. And for those of you who've come from outside today um, to this lecture, um, I uh, uh, welcome. And um, I do also want to assure you that the talk I'm giving today is, um, does not require you to have been part of any of the uh, preceding lectures. And uh, in fact, the material I'm going to talk about uh, doesn't have, uh, is not focused on any of the texts that are, um, uh, that have been part of the course. But I have, uh, but I am returning to certain themes um, that uh, those of you who have been here for this last week uh, will be familiar with um, uh, by now. So um, the title of my talk, as you can see, is Cultures of Secrecy, Literary Imagination, and the Empire. Um, I have for a long time been interested in the overlaps between communication technology and occult knowledge, and their role in the redistribution of power relationships, reaching even into notions of centralized state power and the status of local communities. In earlier work, I had suggested that information networks provided a model of sorts for the occult penetration of closed social networks of the restricted space in which members of different classes and cultures interacted. Telepathy and telegraphy extended the reach of global communication in symmetrical ways. And this is a theme that I discussed in the um, Kipling um, uh, stories, and particularly the story Wireless. And this, in, this um, uh, connection between telepathy and, and telegraphy imitated the occult theory of astral projections outside the body, producing ties that were at once intimate and invasive. As Kipling's short stories reveal, occult literature showed a fascination with communication technologies corroborating the findings of psychical research. And it drew on both to help unearth buried aspects of self repressed by rational forms of thought. Resurfacing in unsettling ways, these hidden aspects of self reveal the blurred cultural space in which disparate social groups lived. And I think this is um, um, a theme that uh, participants in the workshop will recognize by now, you know, with the hidden aspects of self that are um, resurfacing in um, uh, the ways that uh, novelists are treating um, the theme of empire, whether it's uh, um, a Robert Louis Stevenson novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or whether it is um, the um, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes uh, novel, uh, The Sign of Four. Uh, so those of you who've been part of the course will certainly recognize the larger proposition I'm making here. Occultism did not only draw upon newer forms of communication technologies, such as the telegraph or the telephone, but utilized some of their oldest to bring esoteric knowledge within the ambit of bureaucratic rationality. In recent years, my research has focused on the apparent anomaly of spiritual communications being conducted in the epistolary or letter writing form. If you can move to the first slide, please. I have been researching and writing about the celebrated re Russian occultist, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who co-founded the Theosophical Society and moved it to Madras as the international headquarters, which it remains to this day. Blavatsky's profound illuminations about the nature of ultimate reality came to her, or so she claimed, 
in the form of letters from the spiritual adepts, Kut Humi and Maurya, and those are the names of uh, these two spiritual figures who are sometimes called the masters, sometimes they are called the Mahatmas. But these are the spiritual uh, figures that she claimed she was in telepathic communication with. And um, these um, uh, masters or Mahatmas also engaged in lengthy and often fractious correspondence with other prominent theosophists, notably Alfred P. Sinnott, whose Mahatma letters remain among the most arresting works of theosophical literature for the sheer light it throws on European Orientalism. And I've, I published an article some years ago in uh, the journal Critical Inquiry, which is called The Ordinary Business of Occultism, which is based on a study of the Mahatma letter. So if any of you are interested, um, I would refer you to, um, to that article. Um, I, I, and it, for, for it is in this article that I have shown how the masters, the spiritual uh, Mahatmas, mockingly presented themselves as lowly clerical workers in a gargantuan colonial administration, yet adroitly undercut their own self-abasement by claiming that their letters were not written, but what they called precipitated, that is produced by non-mechanical means. The very status of letter writing is rendered indeterminate, at times relying on material implements like pen and paper, and at other times, partaking of the character of spectral technology, both magical in its effect and mundane in its everyday bureaucratic communications. And this is something that has interested me for a very long time, the ways that even the spiritual communications um, uh, with masters and so forth, that they're, that, that, that they're often, these communications are often written ab uh, about as if the subject of these um, communications are you know, clerks in an office. And in that article I just mentioned, the ordinary business, which is why I called it business, of occultism, it's the act of letter writing um, in a kind of very routine and routinized fashion um, uh, that, I, um, that I explore. If the clerk with a pen in his hand is the quintessential image of colonialism, as the site of a new transformation from embodied to institutional knowledge, which we are talking about, the written communications entrusted to the clerk for transcription kept empire in place. The magic of the state is no less so because it is bureaucratized. In this talk, I want to historicize Blavatsky's deliberate turn to letter writing for its importance in reinforcing her discovery of the powers of physical movement offered by religious prophecy and metempsychosis, her travels to remote and inaccessible Tibet in defiance of the British are communicated in letters she wrote to various individuals from Tibet, or so she claimed. These letters, in turn, defied British surveillance methods authorizing the interception of mail by her claim that she had perfected a form of communication that lay beyond interception because it was telepathic, clairvoyant, and astral. In a dynamic of concealment and revelation that informed much of Blavatsky's writing, letters were a crucial site for the selective use of secrecy to create both imperviousness to state surveillance and epistemological uncertainty in those monitoring her movements. Just as the shaman creates a domain, whereas the anthropologist Michael Tausick writes, and I quote, the language of true and false seems not just pe peculiarly inept, but deliberately so, unquote. In Blavatsky, communication became a double-edged sword. Its proliferating technologies as much a condition of increased sec uh, secrecy as of greater openness. In an age when more information was available, there was, however, as David Vincent, who has written an important book called Culture of Secrecy, that as he notes, no intrinsic, there is no intrinsic reason why the enlarged production of information should lead to its untrammeled diffusion. 
Blavatsky conjoined two different discourses of information networks and occultism to draw nature as an object of occultist speculation into the organization of complex modern societies. And those of you who are here for the last lecture on uh, uh, Ryder Haggard, she will make some connections between this attempt that Blavatsky is making um, to draw nature um, um, as, the, uh, as what um, uh, occultism um, seeks to engage with, to draw that idea of nature into the organization of uh, complex modern um, uh, societies. In other words, Blavatsky attempted to do in her work what we saw Aisha um, uh, describing as um, a very different and alternative mode of knowledge, which at the time that Aisha speaks those words, um, cannot be incorporated into the structure of modern um, societies. But that was Blavatsky's project, and one of the continuities I see is between that project of Blavatsky's and, um, and uh, you know, the fictional um, Aisha in Haggard's novel. Full of secret energies accessible only to the imagination, nature both likes to hide itself and be known. And in this simple esoteric insight, she saw the principle that anchored modern society in the uh, manipulations of the state. So this is really the overview that I'm giving about the um, uh, traje uh, trajectory of, uh, of this talk. And if it seems a bit opaque at this point, I hope you will bear with me because I, um, I hope to unpack um, many of these um, uh, comments that I have um, just made. Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, had written a book called Secrecy, The American Experience. And one review of the book begins with a quote from Moynihan that the US president during World War I, Woodrow Wilson, quote, inherited a system of government that valued openness over secrecy, unquote. Despairingly, the reviewer writing in a post 9-11 environment comments and I quote, that's all changed. And this is, I'm quoting from the review. That's all changed in case you've been vacationing in Shangri-La. And this is a, I mean, this is a very specific mode of um, uh, despair at um, that earlier um, uh, comment in Moynihan that, um, um, you know, the US government valued openness over secrecy. Um, uh, and the reviewer's reference to Shangri-La as a, um, as a kind, as a kind of, as a place where one forgets, um, um, you know, a lot of um, what is happening elsewhere, is really what I want to um, use as a, um, you know, sort of as a jumping-off point for um, talking about the the great game and the geopolitical machinations between Russia and uh, Britain at the turn of the uh, 19th century. This re reviewer's reference to Shangri-La only confirms the extent to which this place of eternal changelessness, seemingly, has been exempted from the travails of complex societies, which always have to negotiate a stressful line between people and their government. Shangri-La as a mythic place frozen in time has a peculiar irony when set against the turbulent history of Tibet, caught between Russia and England in their imperial contest for ascendancy in Central Asia. In its remoteness and isolation from the rest of the world, Shangri-La became the notorious construction of a utopian imagination that yearned for a lost purity and simplicity. Immortalized in James Hilton's 1933 novel, Lost Horizon, not as a lost land like Atlantis, as sometimes mistakenly described, but as a land that had succeeded in transcending time by preserving the unmapped library of remnants of world civilizations against all future encroachments. In other words, the project that James Hilton describes in his 1933 novel, 
uh, Lost Horizon is one in which during this, uh, the, during, in, in a period between the two wars, war, World War I and World War II, um, uh, Shangri-La became um, the huge repository of all the knowledge of the world. Um, that Shangri-La was in fact going to be the, uh, like a time capsule of, um, of, all the, uh, of, of all the thought of all the material that had been produced. Uh, the expectation being that the wars will destroy everything that human beings um, had um, uh, created. So the idea of Shangri-La is really one um, where the world awaited the day when the suspended body of knowledge would be reanimated and Shangri-La itself would re-enter history. And this is the, the way that uh, Hilton's novel is constructed, that Shangri-La is simply going to preserve that knowledge, and at one point, uh, that knowledge is going to re-enter um, uh, history. But the fact that Shangri-La is in, is in Tibet is what is uh, um, the point I want to uh, emphasize. Tibet has continued to resonate in the Western romantic imagination as a protective fortress of preserved secret knowledge. Arthur Conan Doyle even had his detective Sherlock Holmes retire to the elevated reaches of Tibet for two years, and I talked about that in class, that, um, you know, that uh, others will recall this as well, that Conan Doyle became so exasperated and bored with uh, Holmes that he killed him off. Um, um, so, you know, for two years, um, until he ha was forced to revive um, Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, through popular demand, uh, for two years, Sherlock Holmes had effectively disappeared from view. Um, and this was, in fact, um, 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 you know, Doyle's uh, rationalization of Sherlock Holmes' missing years, the tantalizing gap of two years between Holmes's fatal encounter with his arch enemy Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls and Holmes's resuscitation to literary life by a weary author caving in to the vociferous demands of a reading public addicted to Sherlock Holmes. And I quote, I traveled for two years in Tibet, therefore, and amused myself by visiting Lhasa and spending some days with the head Lama. This is a quote um, uh, from Sherlock Holmes in uh, Conan Doyle's The Empty House. So this is to explain what happened for two years, that Sherlock Holmes had traveled in Tibet. So these words inspire the modern Tibetan writer, Jamyang Norbu, to ingeniously recreate the untold events that befell Holmes in those missing years. In his 1999 novel, The Mandala of Sherlock Holmes, Norbu reimagines Holmes's role in the liberation of Tibet from Chinese occupation, restoring to Tibet that very history of turbulent confrontation and occupation by imperial forces that went missing in most Western accounts of Shangri-La. And this is something that one sees in Tibetan writers like um, <coughs> like um, Jamyang Norbu, that the Western um, romance of Shangri-La um, mistakenly misrepresents Tibet as a, um, um, as a, as a kind of utopian uh, paradise and evacuates um, to, uh, Tibetan history from a violent history of um, um, occupation by the, uh, the Chinese. So, you know, even, you know, Hilton's theme about, you know, Shangri-La as a place that is frozen and waiting for reanimation um, uh, so that the um, an, uh, archived knowledge would re-enter history. Um, in so many ways, uh, Norbu as a writer tries to, make, to push forward that momentum of Tibetan, re uh, Tibet re-entering um, world history, not as this utopian paradise, but as a place that has been marked by um, colonial conquest and expropriation. Indeed, the myth of Shangri-La achieved its power in the early 20th century precisely because it served to deflect the military tensions between the then two world superpowers, Britain and Russia, especially when those tensions produced uncertainties about who would eventually prevail. 
The great secret at the heart of Kipling's Kim, as the critic Richard, uh, uh, Thomas Richards notes, is knowledge of the time and place at which England and Russia will or will not clash with each other. Because of Britain's anxieties about the unpredictable outcome of its contest with Russia, British commentators could not write about Tibet as openly as they did about military events in India. The Sepoy uprising of 1857, or the mutiny as it is otherwise known, was widely reported in England and vividly depicted in numerous English novels, as many of you know. And the public attention the mutiny received was due in part to England's firm belief in its continued control over its vast colony. Tibet, however, was another story. It is no accident that the secret correspondence between the British government in India and Whitehall in London dramatically increased during the period of England's standoff with Russia over Tibet. Drawing on valuable material from the Russian archives, the Russian historian Tatiana Shomian surmises in her book called Tibet, The Great Game and Tsarist Russia, that Russia was less interested in annexing Tibet than in preventing the strengthening of the British position in Tibet. So, you know, I hope this will give you an even deeper context to read Kipling, those of you who've already been reading it this week, and, <coughs> and those of you who are reading it elsewhere in your, um, uh, in, in your own work. A series of events preoccupying the British, including the Boer Wars, encouraged Russia to move into Tibet. Russian spies, posing as spiritual seekers, made contact with the Dalai Lama, under the influence of whom Tibet entered into a number of secret treaties with Russia. Now, one group of spiritually minded people who did think carefully about Tibet, Afghanistan, and other regions of Central Asia were the Theosophists, who set up, as I said, their international headquarters in Madras. The original founders, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Henry Al Steele Alcott, claimed to have traveled extensively in the areas outside British control, especially in the lands across the northern border. Despite Blavatsky's professed goal to keep the Theosophical Society out of Indian politics, Everything she did while studying the occult was to recruit the local rulers to both theosophy and the containment of British rule. So one of the uh, fallacies that I want to challenge is the one that uh, approaches theosophy as um, virtually um, uh, esoteric in its interests and its preoccupations and apolitical um, uh, in, um, uh, for the most part. And um, I dispute that um, uh, because of, the, um, because of the, uh, the, the textual record that enables one to see the extent to which um, the Theosophical Society was um, secretly um, engaging the, the help um, and the support of um, um, the native, um, um, the, you know, the Rajas of the native states who, um, um, were outside the control of, uh, of the British. So the Theosophists, under the umbrella organization of the, the Theosophical Society, were uh, already engaged in um, a subversive activity of the kind that made um, the British um, highly suspicious um, of them. Um, indeed, the relation between Indian princely rulers and the European uh, occultists cast fresh light on the geopolitical stakes of, of uh, occult pursuits. By the middle of 1882, the Theosophical Society had succeeded in securing a number of princely rulers among their rank and file. Even before Blavatsky's rise to prominence, the Maharajas of Kashmir and Indore had begun to take an interest in the new esoteric movement that had come to their shores. The Sikh Maharaja Bikram Singh joined the ranks of the Theosophical Society and invited Blavatsky and Colonel Alcott to his palace in Faridkot. Their visit marks a pivotal moment in the marriage of theosophy and Indian politics. Alcott went on to visit the Maharaja of Varanasi, 
whose motto, there is no religion higher than truth, was adopted by the Theosophical Society as its own logo. And if you go to the Theosophical Society in Chennai, um, it's a huge you know, uh, compound, one of the largest pieces of real estate in, um, uh, in the city, right in the heart of the city. Um, and you will see this logo, you know, sort of like two, uh, one triangle and then uh, another uh, inverted uh, triangle um, with the motto, there is no religion higher than truth. But um, the, where, the, where they picked up that motto was really from the Maharaja of, um, um, of Varanasi. So the Maharajas played a major role in steering these occultists toward a geopolitical awareness of the regions of Central Asia coveted by the British and the Russians alike. There, uh, I'm just checking the slides because I have, um, okay. There is strong evidence to suggest that the Mahatmas or the, the spiritual adepts who appear as Kutumi and Maurya in the theosophical literature are not at all etherealized figments of Blavatsky's imagination, but are very likely historical personages or a composite of known figures in history. You know, unfortunately, because I had this computer issue, I had these images of, um, you know, the two Mahatmas, um, which are quite striking. They were taken by a German, um, um, you know, who, who um, uh, painted the um, um, uh, photo, uh, painted the images of uh, the two masters, Kutumi and Moria, as uh, Blavatsky uh, uh, narrated her encounters with them and described uh, their physical appearance. And he painted the masters in the ways that she described the um, the masters. So I'm sorry that I I don't have it here. Those images on my uh, on this present computer. But, um, but what I wanted to say, suggest is that um, they, um, they're just not, they're not merely, you know, that kind of, because uh, that's one of the uh, kind of cunning tricks that Blavatsky um, played, that on the one hand she was um, teasing people to um, indicate that the Mahatmas were entirely invisible and that they, she was in communication with them through uh, telepathic means, and that these were spiritual figures who, had, who were disembodied, um, you know, so that they had no material um, reality. But on the other hand, um, there has been some scholarship which I find quite convincing, which describes the two Mahatmas as actually having been a composite of um, uh, various historical um, uh, figures. And um, some of the figures are as disparate as, you know, I think uh, one was um, Ranjit Singh and a, a composite of Ranjit Singh and Matsini. So there's some, um, there's, there's some, uh, I think there's some interesting work that indicates that the Mahatmas are not, um, you know, purely these invisible uh, spectral uh, figures, but that they um, had historical uh, reality. And yet the question remains, why were they rendered um, uh, as if they were invisible spiritual uh, masters? And that's what I would like to get to um, eventually. Blavatsky claimed that the masters were the true authors of her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, while she considered herself only the vessel of their occult transmissions. She insisted that she was not the author of the secret doctrine, but that it was the Mahatmas who were the, uh, the authors, and she was simply the medium of um, um, their um, uh, esoteric transmissions. Indeed, it is perhaps not even so important that Kut Humi and Maurya are modeled on specific historical figures, as they write from the political, politically sensitive border zones of Kashmir, Tibet, and Punjab. And that's the other thing that's coming out in Blavatsky's writing, that she, you know, on the one hand, she says they are dis disembodied. They have no location. They are invisible. But then on the other hand, she says these are, these are communications that are coming to me from Tibet. They're coming to me from Kashmir. So um, uh, these are the areas that are uh, outside the control of the British, and they're also extremely politically sensitive um, areas. The rulers of independent in Indian princely states 
observing the mutual rivalries of Russia and England, played one country off the other and courted major figures in the Theosophical Society because of the occultist critical distance from both Russia and England. And I can't emphasize this point enough that the Theosophists always had a kind of un uneasy relationship with the, um, with the British, despite the fact that Blavatsky's pupil, Annie Besant, um, later did become the president of the Indian National Congress and is known as one of the um, um, you know, premier um, 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 you know, figures in the uh, Indian National Mo uh, Movement, at the same time also tried to keep uh, good relations um, uh, with the British. And one reason why she was, you know, Annie Besant uh, bent over backwards to keep good relations with the British was precisely because of this prehistory in which the theosophical, the theosophists um, uh, remained figure objects of suspicion by the, uh, by the British. To a large extent, theosophy's place in the history of modern India is dictated by its strategies of alliances with the northern princely rulers. Even as the British surveyors and intelligence officers scouted Central Asia, courting Sikh Rajas and Afghan tribal lords alike, in a script we are familiar with because of Kipling's famous description of the great game in Kim, Blavatsky was instructing her cohort to set their sights on securing Sikh allies principally by recruiting them to the Theosophical Society. Playing a critical role in the great game, the Maharajas of Kashmir and Indore staged an encounter between Russia and England, drawing on the help of the Theosophists as they resisted incursions by the British into the native uh, princely states. The great game, in other words, does not simply concern the struggle between Russia and England for control of Central Asia, but represents a significant moment in the Indian movement of resistance to British rule, originating in the native states outside British control in alliance with the uh, Theosophical Society. Can someone switch this fan on, please? Okay, thank you. As Blavatsky herself pointedly remarked, her connections with Russia were far from being a secret. She was, after all, born in Russia and spent her early life there. But much less discussed was her association with Giuseppe Mazzini and the Carbonari. Banned in Italy, the secret society sought to spread its revolutionary agenda to other countries, particularly France and uh, Russia. Blavatsky came in contact with the Carbonari in 1851 and even claimed that as a volunteer, she was wounded in a battle at Mantena where uh, papal troops um, uh, undertook an onslaught against Garibaldi. She met Mazzini, you know, who's often I, you know, identified as a freedom fighter. She met Mazzini in London in the 1850s, and, and, um, and the evidence strongly suggests that at least one historical antecedent of the Mahatma Maurya, um, as I mentioned earlier, the spiritual adept from whom she received the secret doctrine, that one historical antecedent is none other than Mazzini. The Mazzini connection, in short, expands the scope of Blavatsky's importance in the shaping of a particular political future for India. To Mazzini is attributed a stinging critique of the tendencies of the state to secrecy, a part of which I quote uh, here, and that's on the, the PowerPoint, and let me read that. Who were these men 
who treat as enemies their fellow subjects of the realm? Is it their business to prey upon the public or to serve it? Let diplomacy have its secrets, for diplomacy is but a refined mode of modern war warfare, effecting its objects by tricks. But for public servants, we want responsibility, and responsibility cannot be obtained without publicity. Secrecy is but another word for fear. And this was um, Mazzini's um, unremitting um, um, attack on the tendencies of European societies, uh, governments rather I should say, the tendency of European governments and particularly the British government to pursue a, um, a secret agenda that um, uh, was violating the rights of, um, of uh, uh, individuals who were part of that society to have um, access to, you know, to the uh, doings and the goings on of, uh, of government. So this notion that secrecy is but another word for fear um, uh, speaks to the, um, um, you know, the, the ways in which the, the state was already turning its own citizens into enemies. And, um, and this is a thought that I, I, I hope I can um, return to um, later um, you know, when, I, when I speak about um, um, you know, the kind of the, the <coughs> excuse me, the tension between uh, secrecy and secret um, knowledge. But let me get back to Blavatsky and her story and, uh, and Tibet. In September 1882, Blavatsky undertook a mysterious journey from Bombay to Sikkim, passing through Varanasi, Calcutta, Chandanagar, and Kuch Bihar. On the 1st of October, she wrote from the Northern Kingdom of Sikkim to her old friend Alexander Dondukov Korsakov, who was then the military governor of the Transcaucasian region, claiming that she had traveled through the Northwest uh, province, through Darjeeling, Bhutan, Assam, and then Tibet where the English were not allowed to penetrate. Her acquaintance with the Maharajas, who turned theosophist, proved to be helpful in facilitating her travels to the remotest regions. Not only did she go where no Englishmen were allowed, she also went where no women entered. She boasted that her easy access, um, next slide please, she boasted that her easy access to the remote reaches beyond the borders of British India was a testament to her presence as a living incarnation of the Bodhisattva. And, um, and here I have this quote uh, from her. Of course, the English were very angry. I have heard long accounts of their wiles. They are doing their utmost to get into Tibet. They take boys, generally converts, teach them Tibetan, give them a Buddhist education, and when they are ready, dress them up as lamas and give them a prayer wheel in which, instead of the prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum are, are hidden instruments. And some of you might remember Kim, you know, something very uh, sort of uh, uncannily sim uh, similar to this, uh, which is exactly what, uh, you know, Kim is um, um, asked to do by his um, British um, uh, handlers. Um, but then Blavatsky boasts not one of them was able to reach Lhasa or even Shigatse. Then why did they let me pass? It is because I am an incarnation of Buddha. So it's the, it's the, it's the kind of um, braggadocio that she manifested about her great powers of movement and um, that she was able to access even the most uh, remote, most inaccessible um, you know parts of uh, uh, parts of the country and and um, and, uh, and 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 the, and the kinds of connections that she drew between herself and the lamas and the um, and the spiritual uh, mahatmas in in Tibet um, uh, were used as the basis of a claim of a special privilege or a special access. Blavatsky evokes the elusiveness of the masters to explain why she had to undertake her dangerous and arduous journey to Tibet. And this is where I find this notion that the masters are located in these politically sensitive zones particularly interesting. The masters were inaccessible, not only because they lived in remote Tibet, 
they also could not literally be seen, you know, because if they were seen, they, they would be um, arrested, uh, seen within British territory, that is. They would be arrested as possibly uh, being there to um, create uh, um, uh, uh, trouble. Um, so Blavatsky found it convenient to translate their invisibility into the geopolitical terms of the master's reluctance to enter into British territory because they were inhabitants of native states independent of British rule. So this is the, this is the, um, 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 you know, the declaration that she makes about um, uh, the Mahatmas, their invisibility, their, the, the, the need of people like Blavatsky to travel to Tibet to see the masters. It's because, as she claimed, the masters cannot cross the border into British India, that if they did so, they would be um, you know, either put under uh, the watch or they would be even be simply um, um, arrested. So it's this, this, this um, um, interchangeability between the languages of spirituality and geopolitics that one can see running through so much of, um, you know, of her, of Blavatsky's work, but I would also suggest that it's something that we have been seeing in the novels that we've read um, uh, this week, this interchangeability between spirituality and geopolitics, that the two cannot, the two do not exist in independent domains. They're constantly intersecting. By undertaking a spiritual journey to visit the masters, Blavatsky underscored how thoroughly spiritual pilgrimage was necessitated by political constraints, that is, the sharp boundaries marking off British India from the rest of Central and Northwest Asia. It is no accident that the masters in Blavatsky's worldly imagination inhabited the very regions threatened by a Russian invasion that so obsessed the British in India. Blavatsky regarded the masters in much the same way that the British and the Russians viewed the Afghan and Caucasus rulers as fiercely independent persons who resisted being co-opted by either one of the rival powers. Blavatsky's claims about traveling great distances to meet the Mahatmas only aroused more suspicions about her Russian interests, for the British government in India was convinced that religious meetings and pilgrimages were particularly susceptible to intrigues and seditious alliances, and that holy men were as dangerous as armed um, insurgents. And I think this is in the next, um, yeah, I think it's in the next um, slide. So, So, um, to continue, Blavatsky's letters to the Russian military governor are a highly revealing commentary on the Anglo-Russian tensions uh, prevalent at the time. Forever dogged by the British suspicion that she was a Russian spy, Blavatsky even appeared as a character in a novel called Hildreth, in which she was depicted as a spy in the service of the Russian government passing secret communications while pretending to exchange pleasantries in her numerous um, letters. So Blavatsky was quite vilified by the British um, during her own time, and she even uh, became a subject in some of these novels in which her, um, um, uh, you know, her uh, subversive uh, character, um, that she was painted as a, a spy who was working for the uh, Russians. Curiously, Blavatsky never denied that charge, even as she insisted that her Russian, a relation with her Russian interlocutors was principally a journalistic one. Letter writing, as in so many different instances involving theosophy and its worldwide movement, plays a prominent role both as material activity and ironic enactment of the bureaucratic compulsions during imperial rule. And this is to restate what I said in the beginning, that letter writing has a particularly um, um, uh, um, um, a meaningful role in um, 
the, this, uh, um, these occult communications, because letter writing was basically what the British government was doing for 90% um, of the time, you know, writing letters, writing minutes, you know, uh, compiling records, sending them to England, receiving dispatches. So letter writing was truly, um, you know, one of the uh, most, uh, you know, the kind of uh, bottom line work of uh, uh, colonial um, administration. And in, in some ways, Blavatsky was mocking that uh, preoccupation by resorting to letter writing to show how her letter writing was able to escape some of the uh, tedium and limitations of um, the bureaucratic type of writing. Both Blavatsky and Alcott were shadowed by the government, and they were finally released from suspicion only when they agreed to stay out of Indian politics. But until the British eased their suspicions of, the, uh, of these two, Blavatsky and Alcott were the, among the first to feel the effects of British legislation, uh, next slide please, making it lawful to open the mail of suspected individuals. I mean, this was legislation that um, was, uh, um, um, that was being enacted in, um, in England, um, uh, justification being that uh, using the Russia uh, menace as the alibi that uh, with Russians um, sending in spies across the border into uh, a British controlled uh, territory, uh, it was important for the British to be able to, uh, to intercept um, uh, mail. And Blavatsky and Alcott were among those to feel um, uh, this, uh, um, uh, uh, this intrusion. Blavatsky insistently, uh, she incessantly complained about having her letters monitored by the English political uh, department even as she mocked their lack of success. Um, in the name of surveillance, particularly of Irish insurgents, the Official Secrets Act, and this is what it was called, the Official Secrets Act, it made it permissible to intercept mail, particularly in times of war. As expected, not only were the letters of potential subversives on the watch list opened, so too were the letters of uh, suffragettes, you know, the ones who were seeking uh, women's equality and other um, agitators. So this Official Secrets Act was um, um, a very loosely interpreted to um, allow the British to open the mail of anyone they suspected, not just those who were um, um, you know, political subversive, but women um, and working class um, 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 uh, movements. So it, it, it became a um, kind of focal point of um, uh, tension between you know, the kind of new powers that the English state was assuming and um, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, deprivation of the rights of individuals to uh, privacy and um, autonomy. So ostensibly intended to target subversive closer to England's home front, um, particularly the Irish. So you know, this Official Secrets Act began with Ireland, but the legislation extended to British-controlled India as well. In circumventing the British monitoring of her activities, Blavatsky boasted that she had devised a form of communication that was beyond interception because it was astral. By astral, of course, she meant the invisible means by which messages were received um, from the remote masters in um, uh, Tibet. And indeed, while the ostensible subject of her um, uh, book, The Secret Doctrine, is the privileged communication of the most profound truths about the evolution of life forms. The work consistently tropes letter writing as the mundane means by which such truths are known. If you can move, yeah, if you, yes, exactly, thank you. The flurry of letters between Blavatsky and other theosophists and the letters sent to and by the Tibetan masters, uh, Kuthumi and Morya, in the form of occult transmissions self-consciously reproduces the clerical nature of British governance in India. And I would suggest that it's a tongue-in-cheek reminder that control of the colonies was dependent on reams of dreary paperwork. 
So it is not at all surprising that Blavatsky, thumbing her nose at colonial officers, should mimic their predominant activity, that is of letter writing in the offices, and draw attention to the repetitive, bureaucratic, and numbingly mechanical aspects of the life introduced into colonial India. She did what the colonial administration excelled in. She wrote letters. And she claimed superiority over the British administrators because she could transmit her letters faster and without interception, and because her means of communication were telepathic and spectral. In short, she summoned the authority of the bureaucratic state in order to, to, to deflect its mechanisms of control. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, so this is, re this is really the kind of um, the breakthrough that she, um, that she made, which was to, you know, to evoke um, the bureaucratic state and the way that it uh, organized its, its subjects. Um, she evoked that authority in order to evade the control of that, um, of that authority by claiming that um, uh, you know, her mode of communication was far superior because it was telepathic and not material. So I wanted to make a reference to um, the sociologist Max Weber, who was in fact the person who coined the um, term routinization. Um, and he spoke about the routinization of charismatic authority. But routinization was a, was a favorite word of uh, Max Weber to talk about um, modern bureaucracy. And Weber's uh, uh, in interest was in um, you know, um, you know, how modern bureaucracy has developed the um, means of, um, of um, organizing um, you know, it, um, the citrus, and, uh, you know, organizing its work, and thereby controlling um, vast segments of uh, society. Um, um, but that, you know, that modern bureaucracy is um, just the opposite of the, the heroic, the active, the, the um, you know, the physically um, mobile um, person. You know, I've, in my lectures, I've been talking about, you know, this divide between the active, the agent who is out in the field, um, you know, courting danger, securing, um, you know, uh, knowledge. Um, like Kim in the first novel we read, but then there are others who are the managers, you know, the ones who are, uh, who require the efforts of the active agents, um, uh, but that it's the managers who are, uh, are confined to the shadowy realm, who control everything and yet remain uh, obscure in, um, out, of, um, um, out of sight. And yet it's those managers who control um, everything um, uh, in that uh, society, and um, this is this is this is what Max Weber talked about as the um, rise of modern bureaucracy. And at the center of his vision of modern bureaucracy was the clerk with a pen in his hand. And I have this quote here from um, Weber, um, where he says, "Administrative acts, decisions, and rules are formulated and recorded in writing." even in cases where oral discussion is the rule or is even mandatory. The combination of written documents and a continuous organization of civil functions constitutes the office, which is the central focus of all types of modern corporate action. So uh, the clerk who is a, a cog in the machine of government spent most of his time writing letters and reading those sent to him. And John Stuart Mill, you know, the great John Stuart Mill, who wrote Representative Democracy and, uh, you know, son of James Mill. Um, you know, John Stuart Mill had himself worked at the East India House for many years. And he had remarked that the whole government of India is carried on in, in, in writing. He said, there can be no government of India if there is no writing. All the orders given and all the acts of the executive officers are reported in writing. And the whole of the original correspondence is sent to the home government. In fact, this was the work 
that John Stuart Mill did in the East India House. He basically read all the letters and the correspondence and the dispatches that came from India. Um, so this, um, you know, given the sort of the immense power that these um, uh, people in the offices are now beginning to assume, um, you know, you had to have uh, trustworthy people who were doing this kind of, they were receiving sensitive documents, they were receiving all kinds of, you know, uh, telegrams and secret dispatches. So you had to have, um, um, you know, people who were reliable, who were trustworthy. And so, you know, there's, I, I'm not going to be able to talk too much about this, but I did just want to throw out this idea that moral education became vitally important, both in India and in England, because the class of people who were entrusted with the most vital documents were the clerks who had to be fully trustworthy. In noting that the main channel of administration and governance was through handwritten communication, I hope two points will emerge. First, while it is true letters serve the function of advancing everyday transactions, the principal impact of the activity was to reinforce the patterned regularity and tedium of modern life. And second, the letters' claims of urgency had no impact on the speed of their transmission. So it didn't matter if a telegram or a you know, or um, not a telegram, but if a letter said urgent on the top, you know, it was still going to take the three months or whatever um, from, uh, you know, uh, 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 to be sent from India to England or England to um, uh, India. Didn't matter whether it said urgent uh, or what have you. Um, so it's these two points that the, you know, if, if letter writing has become uh, what the work of uh, government um, uh, consists of, one has to uh, deal with the fact that there's a lot of tediousness, right? I mean, we all know that, you know, that uh, the, um, um, it's, it's the kind of drudgery of, uh, of office work. And then, but then this other point about um, 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 trans speed of transmission um, um, allowed there to be a temporal gap between command and execution that exacted a toll on the exertion of authority. So where you had gaps like this, um, you know, that a command is issued or a certain piece of crit critical information is being sent, but if it takes so long to receive that note, um, you know, authority too is slowly um, being, um, uh, um, you know, if not challenged, at least, um, 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 you know, it's certainly being pressured. The accumulation of public business around correspondence left the colonial government awash in a field of paperwork that quickly defined the work of governance as mind-numbing. The contradiction, let me just check the PowerPoint here uh, to make sure. Oh, did I have the John Stuart Mill, the one? The next one was. So, um, if you, you know, if you want to take a look at this, uh, maybe if you can move to the second one. No, just keep it there. Um, the contradiction between the drudgery of everyday letter writing and the intellectual refinements expected of the governing class was not lost on Blavatsky, who exploited the inflated importance of the clerk in colonial administration to place communication on a different register altogether. Her communications, she boasted, had the advantage of speed, because telepathically communicated, secrecy, because since astrally committed, transmitted, they were impervious to material inter interceptions um, and state surveillance, and trustworthiness, because they bypassed the notoriously unreliable clerks whom the British government routinely suspected of passing on secret documents to their enemies. Letter writing becomes the site of competitive claims to truth based on speed, secrecy, and trustworthiness. So there's even this idea of truth, you know, how does one determine what is truth? Is now becoming, that question is becoming linked to um, the, the speed, secrecy, and trustworthiness. In the absence of any of them, truth also becomes more problematic. 
Furthermore, the spiritual master's remoteness and reticence reinforce their authority, which in turn assure their trustworthiness and honorableness, values which were often the first casualties in the, first, in the fraught relations between high-ranking British officers and their native clerks. Carrying out the master's orders without question, as Blavatsky claimed she did, and submitting to the code of secrecy that their transmissions entailed, conferred reality on the master's existence in a gesture that stemmed from acceptance of their authority as, sil as remote, silent figures. By conjoining secrecy and trust and linking both to authority, Blavatsky cleverly bypassed the question of whether the masters were real or not. Ironically, the masters' aloofness, you know, their, their uh, isolation, if you want to call it that, in, in Tibet, you know, the fact that they are just, you know, aloof, far away, parallels what Edward Bulwer Lytton described as the discreet reserve of the English. And I have um, a couple of notes about Bulwer Lytton, who, by the way, was a major influence on um, Blavatsky. She claimed, in fact, that Bulwer Lytton was her mentor. Um, he was the author of some very well-known novels during his period, one of which was The Fall of Pompeii. Um, the other was The Coming Race, you know, The Coming Race. Uh, which is a very short novel which I would uh, uh, very much encourage you to read. Um, it's not at all surprising that Bulwer Lytton provides the link to Blavatsky and to the combination of disclosure and reserve. She made a trademark of her writing. I mentioned some of his novels, but I think one of his most remarkable works, which is not a novel, but is uh, actually a kind of um, uh, essay, a, a, lo a long extended essay, it's called England and the English, which was published in 1833. And in this work, England and the English, Bulwer Lytton linked English reserve to the character of the English class structure. Now, this is an important point, so bear with me as I, as I talk about this. Now, I think all of you are familiar with this notion of the stiff upper lip, right, which is associated with, with cultural reserve, you know, that the British um, uh, uh, um, you know, prided themselves for their stiff upper lip that um, um, not given to wild bursts of passion or energy, but um, being very self-contained, self-controlled, and uh, reserved. You know, the, uh, the crucial word is reserved. And Bulwer-Lytton linked English cultural reserve to the structure of the society. Englishmen, he maintained, were reluctant to say anything that would expose them to class condescension. Hence, he wrote, and I'm quoting from Bulwer Lytton, proceeds the most noticeable trait in our national character, our reserve. He's, he describes the British um, um, reticence um, um, as one coming out of fear of being uh, mocked um, as a uh, déclassé you know, somebody who is uncouth or um, says things which are inappropriate. So he says that the Englishman has cultivated this reserve uh, primarily out of a fear of mockery that such a person would, um, you know, who, um, you know, said something without uh, thinking uh, spontaneously, who spoke spontaneously, would be mocked for the accent, for inappropriate or whatnot. So he said that the English have cultivated this art of saying very little, if nothing at all. And this is what he called a distinct English um, uh, cultural trait of, of, of uh, not speaking at all. Self-control or reticence becomes an integral part of English culture, he said, and the moral authority of the English gentleman. All forms of excess are shunned, including including the needless exchange of information. So if someone asks you something, um, if you can answer simply by saying yes or no, um, without going into any more elaboration, that is the best possible kind of, um, of response. Uh, if, you can, if you can say what needs to be said, uh, give the, uh, uh, respond in such a way that the uh, the response contains the necessary information, 
well and good, but never go beyond that uh, necessary information. So this is what he meant by withholding, you know, keeping to oneself what one doesn't need to say. So that, and this is where I, I find an interesting connection between um, this culture of reserve, because gentlemanly culture did not indulge in disclosing official information, official secrecy did not conflict with the liberal state's commitment to the public sphere. And this is what Bulwer-Lytton was trying to get at, that this idea of holding, withholding secrets, only saying what you have to, and not divulging anything that is unnecessary, that if this is the way that one is, um, um, you know, if this is a cultural ideal, then all these official secrets acts that are being legislated, which um, um, really infringed on the rights of citizens, um, you know, that their letters were being opened, that their, um, that, you know, that their um, you know, communications were being intercepted, um, but what Bulwer-Lytton is suggesting is that there is this, um, 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 you know, that just the way that English culture is developing um, a model of secrecy in the individual made it permissible for the British government to also um, pursue um, uh, its own agenda of secrecy because it was simply affirming a cultural trend. And the term that Bulwer-Lytton came up with was honorable secrecy. He said this is honorable secrecy. And this concept deflected attention from restrictions in the flow of information from the state. Gentlemanly reserve produced the illusion that secrecy was a function not of the power of the state, but of the values of a private community. And this is a, you know, I mean, this is the kind of clever move that's made here, that as this cultural ideal is developing, um, the, the practices of government, um, uh, where they're running their own um, sort of separate empire and not letting people know what's going on elsewhere, the, you know, the massacres that are being committed, the, the infringements of rights that are being committed, that all of this is, um, um, you know, becomes, um, a, uh, it can be assimilated into this cultural ideal of the gentlemanly um, uh, reserve. So if democracy, you know, let me say then, if democracy is characterized by the participation of all citizens in the state, then it stands to reason that the denial of participation throws the legitimacy of the modern liberal state into question. Thus, by being secretive, the state violates its compact with its citizens and loses the right to govern. Yet restricting access to official information salvages the state from the state charge of curbing citizens' participation and valorizes secrecy as essential to ensuring their um, security. This new valuation is possible only by a shift in secrecy's meaning from the denial of full participation in state activities to limited access to official information. So, um, you know, I mentioned David um, Vincent, you know, in his book on the culture of secrecy, and he concludes, and I quote, thus it was, you know, can I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, David Vincent had written that, and I quote, thus it was that the development of culture of discrete reserve exactly coincided with the creation of the modern system of collecting and disseminating government um, information. So this observation applies equally well to the culture of silence adapted by Blavatsky and other theosophists 
to the purpose of philosophical inquiry. Thank you. Um, even as, so, you know, I'm, now I'm coming back to Blavatsky. I'm, I'm sort of laying out this association between the culture, um, you know, the, the culture of um, discreteness um, and the uh, release that is given to the British government to pursue these secretive agendas. So this observation of, of David Vincent applies well to the culture of silence adapted by Blavatsky and other theosophists to the purposes of philosophical inquiry. Even as Blavatsky and her adepts were elusive about the source of their powers, they were totally preoccupied with the task of establishing institutions that would preserve and disseminate their occult wisdom. Blavatsky employs a web of obscure allusions in her mythography, but then at the same time, she provides a detailed glossary to decode the obscurities. And I've always been interested in uh, something which seems anomalous, because everyone says, you know, these theosophists are very secretive. They don't, they have their own, like, their private societies. Even today, I think in, if you go to the uh, Theosophical Society in Chennai, they are very, um, you know, they seem very self-enclosed. They don't want to publicize uh, what they do. And yet, at the same time, they have um, these big public um, conventions. In fact, even as I'm speaking, you know, in the last week of December, from January, ironically, from December 26 to December 31st, the, Theoso the same dates as my uh, lectures, the Theosophical Society has its international annual convention. So that, and there are you know, thousands, at least 4,000, 5,000 people turn up at this convention. Uh, and they discuss very publicly and have these public readings and, you know, everyone, you know, goes to these, uh, these events. And so there's, there seems to be something that is at odds, you know, that on the one hand, it's like this very exclusive private coterie. And then on the other hand, there are all these very big public events um, um, that, uh, that are not just attended by the theosophists and, are not, and, the, and, and the, some of the main speakers are not even the theosophists. They are, you know, p people in public life. So it, there's, this, there's this conundrum. And I think one, another conundrum I can, I can point to is Blavatsky, you know, that she used very obscure language in her own work which makes her very frustrating to read. But then she also gives you a glossary. She published a book called Theosophical Glossary. So for every incomprehensible word, she has a very detailed um, explanation. This is something that even modern literary theorists will not do. They will just throw out all kinds of jargon without giving you the theosophical, um, without giving you the, the glossary. But the theosophists did that and um, um, so, you know, theosophies, um, you know, if I can skip a little bit here. Um, um, so what I would, you know, what I would conclude by this is that, that is the, by this public-private um, anomaly, is that the public dissemination of occult literature is intended to convert a materialistic world into an acceptance of the spiritual path, that indeed proselytism is an important aim of occult movements. While this is certainly true, Blavatsky's and other occult writers' awareness of political developments suggest that their activities, often paralleled in parodic, critical, or documentary ways, some of the key aspects of bureaucratic statecraft. In fact, occult literature plays off the everyday, routinized transactions attached to modern uh, bureaucracy to present itself in turn as the public history of secret um, uh, knowledge. Uh, do we, I think there, I've missed uh, the next slide. You know, I should have had this slide earlier on. And then the next slide after this. Yeah, this is, this is where, where I am right now. So it stands to reason, maybe I can just have a, It stands to reason that knowledge cannot effectively be withheld without first producing trust. One must first trust the integrity 
and authority of those who impose secrecy. Um, Blavatsky used you know, this language of trust and discourse, um, uh, claiming that the spiritual masters with whom she was in communication um, spurred uh, demonstrations. Um, uh, so indeed, the masters via Blavatsky's mediumship insisted that their main intent was to close the gap between intellectual elite skepticism and mass, and mass superstition and gullibility by not capitalizing on super phenomenal events, implicitly echoing Foucault in the birth of the clinic that the conflict of modern times was not between old beliefs and young knowledge, but between two types of knowledge. Again, a theme that we've been seeing uh, throughout the course is not like modern knowledge versus ancient knowledge or young knowledge versus old knowledge, but two different types of knowledge altogether. Blavatsky discredited magic as furthering the divide between archaic beliefs and modern knowledge. Rather than being conjurers, the masters were described by Blavatsky as anxious to restrain themselves and not reveal their tricks or powers. She insisted that neither she nor the masters wanted to be performers who turned their, um, um, you know, their, their performance in, for entertainment value. The master stood for self-restraint, she insisted. It's like she's saying things that Bulwer-Lytton did, that, you know, that um, the masters are about self-restraint, uh, implicitly recalling Bulwer-Lytton's discreet reserve. The master's imposition of silence and secrecy on themselves was intended to secure the trust of people. So when they were described as remote and as silent, that that remoteness, in fact, became um, uh, one reason why they could be believed. You know, it didn't matter whether they were real or not real, whether they were invisible or they were visible. But the fact that their, their, their remoteness um, um, and, their, and their, their refusal to just speak for the sake of speaking um, made them secure the trust of people. Secrecy is thus not just for exclusionary, mystifying purposes, but for engendering the authority that comes from trust. So you can see that what Blavatsky is doing in her work is to take the idea of this British governmental secrecy as negative, as, as nefarious, as harmful, and she's offering another way of thinking about secrecy, um, uh, one that allows for producing the authority that comes from trust. Secrecy goes against the very character of performance. The masters acquire unlimited power through disembodied mobility. But Blavatsky makes it very clear that neither she nor they want to exercise power in the name of tricking people. The real power of the masters for her lay in her showing, showing the new possibilities um, of the self. Coincidentally, in inverse proportion to the masters in Blavatsky's narrative, pushing positivism past the certainties of known boundaries into unknown regions, the British intelligence agents operated in Central and South Asia with instruments that relied on notions of positivist quantification. Yet these instruments, so strange to the inhabitants of these regions, are interpreted as Western sorcery. And I think in the novel we read yesterday and today, King Solomon's Mines, you know, the, the, um, you know, the rifle and the almanac, you know, they're all seen as um, you know, part of Western um, sorcery. And Peter Hopkirk, who's a journalist, had written a book called The Great Game, you know, quite simply, and he described British Lieutenant Alexander Burns' secret mission to Kabul for, uh, as momentarily jeopardized by the Afghan tribesmen's discovery of sextants, books, and other things, objects in his baggage. But Burns is relieved when he, when he is let go, for he says, they set us down without doubt as conjurers after a display of such unintelligible apparatus. The fact that the Afghan tribesmen couldn't figure out what, you know, these sextants, these um, um, you know, these uh, geometrical, these uh, geometric devices are for, 
that they were conjurers. At least that was their deduction. So the mapping of the regions beyond the immediate control of the British in India required precise instruments and periodic thrusts into the mountainous reaches of, uh, uh, of India quickly became a science in itself. But the science of exploration was as esoteric to the people of the region as their traditions of learning and belief were to the British rulers. On the other hand, the opposite perspective is expressed in Bulwer Lytton's account in England and the English, you know, where he writes of an ancient writer of a certain district in Africa who writes about a regularly occurring frightful phenomenon. And I'm quoting from Bulwer Lytton. The air seemed filled with gigantic figures of strange and uncouth monsters. Um, these apparitions were necessarily a little alarming to foreigners, but the natives looked upon them with the utmost indifference. You know, so that one group of people will look at something and be shocked and frightened by them. Another group of people will look at the same thing and, not, and it will not even elicit any response. And what is coming out here is the discrepant notions of fear and terror, which are attributes of radically destabilizing difference that constructs magic in one instance and normality in the other. So I had something here about um, print, which I'm going to, um, I'm going to skip. Anyway, so uh, I think there's one more slide. Let me see. Yeah, if you can just put the last slide, yeah. If, and this is really the end. If modernity's environment of increased capacity for movement is enabled by new means of transportation, what occultism adds is the capacity for movement by secret communication. The extraordinary commentaries provided by Blavatsky and the masters themselves on the transmission of letters, not to speak of the use of individuals as go-betweens or mediums, reveal the importance they placed on the new forms of communication into which even spiritualistic agencies could be inserted. Indeed, the yoking of spiritual power to scientific advances is not the least of the theosophist's interest. And Blavatsky made the brilliant move of not only connecting spiritualism with spirituality, but also modern technology with mysticism. At the interface between secrecy and secret knowledge, instant communication became the tissue of connection between two different modalities. For if the chief characteristic of the pre-technological age is the open, visible character of the available means of communication and transportation, technology confers on unseen agencies the instrumentality of mechanical power. Blavatsky exploits this possibility to blur the boundaries between history and fiction and claims that technology shares with mysticism the experience of disembodiment, projection, and time-space com compression. And so, as I am, this is my concluding paragraph, as official secrecy acts came into being, Blavatsky brought occult knowledge into a discursive contact zone that exposed the fragile boundaries around publicity and public history. She played around with the contradiction that what was hitherto invisible or unknown, be it the power of technology or the occult secrets of nature, erupts into public consciousness at precisely the same time that the everyday world of democratic access and participation becomes more shadowy and more opaque. I have argued that the passing of a series of official secrets acts in Britain provides a context in which to observe these contradictions. For as the colonial state becomes more and more secretive, the esoteric knowledge of the colonized world is routinized, normalized, and made part of the, of the corpus of knowledge comprising the world's archive. Should it surprise us that as government enacts official secrecy acts and enforces restrictions on access to documents on government activities, <clears throat> 
It cultivates an interest in occult knowledge and promotes a study in the institutionalized context of comparative literature, religion, and philosophy. Organizations like the Theosophical Society, which were devoted to the study of occult ph phenomena and the evolutionary history of cosmic being, may have been exclusive cliques at the outset, but they quickly turned to the mass dissemination of occult literature throughout their worldwide publications, conferences, and public lectures. So indeed, it is often hard to explain what was so secret about the secret knowledge when it was so broadly discussed in public forums. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I was a bit long, but uh, that's been the story of this workshop. <laughs> Uh, 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 considering uh, that you are talking about the uh, uh, similarity between the way technology operates and the way this mystical uh, 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 modes of communication operates. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, 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 the way technology operates in contemporary era, uh, uh, we can draw any connection between the way information society uh, as we live right now the way it operates now and the way it used to operate during the 19th and 20th century colonial era. Do you think there, there are any connections, if any? Did you want me to take up everything at the end? Is that what you said? Um, yeah, I mean, I can answer this now, or rather, you know, address this. Okay, okay. Um, sure, I, um, I think it is continuous. And I, you, know, you might remember in one of the uh, lectures I spoke about the black box concept. In fact, that was a concept that came from uh, Max Weber, who, as I mentioned here, um, spoke, um, uh, wrote extensively about uh, the emergence of modern bureaucracy. But he also um, was trying to, uh, you know, he was very interested in, you know, science uh, uh, and how it, how it becomes a profession. And, um, and Weber had, um, you know, um, he described an instance where he said, uh, we look at you know, certain, uh, the, the technology around us, and he's looking at this really, you know, he's talking about late 19th, early 20th century. He said, you look at a tram car, and you wonder how the tra tram car moves, um, but you can't explain it. You know, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the vocabulary, you don't have the wherewithal to explain you know, how technology manages to um, to do things like you know the movement of of tram cars um, and uh, and Weber said you know there's a point at which uh, we internalize uh, and accept really not just internalize but we accept the idea of a black box that um, something has an inherent uh, an intrinsic mode of of, of operating which um, you know doesn't require your comprehension for you know for that technology to you know to be what it is and um, it's like the way you know and and the parallel that I was drawing between that and occult um, ideas is that um, that is the very principle of mystification that you um, you know that you can't explain um, you know how uh, you, know, um, you know, someone is suddenly recalling past lives. You can't explain certain things. Um, and while the rational predisposition is to uh, always give account of what has happened, and you think of the ca a character like Sherlock Holmes, who has to be able to identify you know, how something has ha um, become what, what it has. Um, but Weber said there's a point at which you know, um, um, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to, we have to stop. That we will not be able to enter a certain space of explanation, and that's what he described as the black box. And I presume that is something that continues into the contemporary forms of uh, of technology as well. The examples he gave were really current to the technology of his time, to tram cars and whatnot. And in our day, it could be the technology of the internet, you know, to try to explain how the internet works is really something that will baffle many of us. And yet we all continue to use it. 
that's the point. You know, we use something, we depend on something without ever really truly understanding, you know, what it, um, you know, uh, you know, how it is. And something to that effect is also um, there in occult ideas that one, you know, to simply denounce something as occult is to also deny that so much of what one does in life involves some measure of, um, uh, you know, some measure of the occult. And there are some examples that, you know, uh, fleetingly came to mind when, when you were asking this question and they've, they fled right now. But the, you know, some things that we do, um, maybe I will remember by tomorrow morning. Um, but, the, you know, this idea that, you know, we, um, we, we depend on certain things without ever being able to understand why. You know, and there's no rational explanation for why, uh, you know, we do um, uh, certain things or we observe uh, certain things. And, um, you know, so, so that really is, um, you know, how I would view this. Uh, I thank you for the, the egalitarian ideas when uh, literary culture was developing that people were starting writing letters and communicating uh, and this matters a lot, communication that the British also brought an act uh, which was very detrimental um, to the very act of communication uh, and it is a conundrum uh, I would like to know uh, I would like to like you to place this whole notion of you know uh, uh, kind of uh, rise of egalitarian ideas and rise of activism in the context of uh, education because without education this wouldn't be possible and what's the question I want you to locate these, uh, you know, uh, the, the motives of British mm -hmm. in uh, bringing this particular act. The official secret uh, act. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the context of activism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the context of activism and in the context of, uh, you know, education that was given to at, le at least some of the people were educated uh, in India too. Uh, in, in uh, you know, distant pockets, not, uh, you know. It, this seems to me like two different questions, so that's why I'm trying to understand the relationship to, uh, between them. But there, I think in the paper I was referring at one point to the need for moral education. You know, that the, that the you know, the, I know I've written about this elsewhere, so I'm not going to go too far into this, but you know, this uh, imperative of creating moral uh, colonial subjects, you know, who, um, you know, who will um, discard the elements of dishonesty and uh, lack of responsibility, you know, all the stuff that is the bulwark of um, uh, the introduction of Western education. But I, I was particularly struck, uh, you know, when I was reading this material, uh, which I talked about here, that moral education figures in an important way. And it is because of this issue of trust and responsibility. So the British didn't call for moral education in an abstract way. It wasn't simply that, oh, moral education, we are a moral people and we must introduce the same morality to the Indians. It wasn't just that. It was actually something which is more strategic, which is what I was trying to suggest here that the need for moral education comes about from a very practical need, which is that the people who were doing all this letter writing in the British offices were lower division Indian clerks. So they needed to have people who were trustworthy, you know, the people who would be able to recognize right from wrong. And that is, you know, so the, the drive for um, moral education had very, very practical and very strategic um, reasons. It wasn't simply coming out of abstract, uh, you know, kind of an abstract concept. Uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, British had a very, you know, um, uh, 
kind of confused ideology or confused ideas when they uh, thought of bringing the reforms in Indian education. Uh, at the beginning, uh, they were very hesitant to uh, you know, deal with moral education because they thought it would be, you know, um, you know, it would be actually uh, getting into uh, trouble because moral goes along with religion. So, so they always try to say that uh, they are going to give a kind of secular education and at the same time they had this purpose. So how would you, how would you look at it? This purpose meaning? This purpose is moral, uh, you know, making the citizen, you know. Uh, yeah, but this, you, you just said it now that the moral education is not necessarily driven by the religious motivations. You know, I know this is something, I mean, I, because I had written about this in my, in my first book, I have been quite um, sort of connected to this point that the um, British, um, um, you know, that the education that they brought in uh, via English literature as a kind of embodiment of the values of, um, um, you know, moral thinking and right thinking, that literature became a surrogate for Christian instruction. In fact, for a long time, Christian missionaries were not allowed into India by the British uh, East India Company, not by the Indians alone. It was, was the, the fear of the East India Company was that if they let the missionaries in, it would cause a lot of um, antagonism between the, um, um, uh, between the uh, Indians and the, and the British because um, Indians would, uh, would feel that their religious sensibilities were being offended. So at the same time, the British were driven by the need for having um, you know, moral um, education. That this is the point that I'm trying to make here, that that moral education is one that is, was not just an abstract concept, but it was something that was driven by the practical need to have people who are working in their offices who would be responsible, trustworthy, and you know, know right from wrong. And they believed that only those concepts could be taught in, uh, through British education. Uh, the missionaries were not allowed for a long time. Yeah, not they, until 1813. Yeah, they feared that uh, it will harm their commercial interests. But later on when they allowed them, they also found an advantage in their presence because education and such other welfare activities that the missionaries undertook is usually the prerogative of the state. And with, since they were providing without the state having to bother uh, much, uh, that was one reason why they tolerated the missionaries. That is what Guha refers to as the symbiotic relationship between the state and the missionaries. Well, the missionaries, you know, they had this very convoluted um, um, history and um, yeah, until 1813, the, the uh, curbs on their um, on missionary work were so uh, severe that it was only when, you know, with people like Charles Grant, who was act actively out advocating for, um, you know, kind of Christian, Christianization of, uh, of, uh, of India. I mean, this was the time also when the abolitionist movement was very strong. In, in Britain and this idea of you know, England is a moral nation and as a moral nation had a moral obligation to, um, you know, to the people uh, where it was governing. So that ambition was, um, um, uh, you know, was, was very strong and, and so for a long time the East India Company which was, which was basically just a trading company and, and was more concerned in protecting its, uh, its commercial interest than it was in you know, bringing civilization to India. It's only when that this shift had begun to take place, when these administrative structures were more ingrained within India, that the, that, you know, and, and I will contend actually that it was the office that became a very vital place for the articulation of new ideas of um, you know, what was necessary and what was good for Indian uh, subjects. For a long time, missionaries and the, in the, and the English remained in tension with, the, uh, with each other. And the, mission, and the missionaries were being monitored by the British go government. Even in 1813, they had to furnish the bond of good behavior mm -hmm. uh, before coming to India. Mm -hmm. 
and they had to furnish some amount to be kept as mm. deposit, mm. which would be forfeited mm. uh, if the terms were not adhered to. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, in the context of uh, neocolonialism and digitalism, uh, how would you look at the concept of artificial intelligence and how would you connect that concept with the, the to topics you have presented in this session? Could you elaborate a little further about what you, what, what, what you were thinking of? I mean, why, why artificial I, intelligence? I mean, does artificial intelligence complicate things uh, uh, when it comes to secrecy? And uh, uh, how, how would you connect the artificial intelligence with the, the new empire? Are you talking about cyber, things like cyber security? Is that what you mean? No, no. Uh, I mean uh, detective hmm? uh, secrecy. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something here. Uh, the artificial intelligence of, uh, you mean just, are you talking about um, like, you know, artificial intelligence covers a lot of territory. So specifically, what were you thinking of? Now, would you uh, talk about artificial intelligence and uh, occultism? Uh, can you connect them in any way? Uh, I could if I wanted to, you know, and if I, I could also say that artificial intelligence is, um, you know, it draws on, um, you know, if you can say it, it draws on things that you can't see and that you can't, um, you know, that doesn't have a body, that artificial intelligence is artificial and therefore you can say that it is occult. I think that's about the most that I can say, but I'm not able to take it beyond that. Ma'am, uh, if I can add something to what Alpin was asking. Recently, uh, Google, or I, don't know, I don't remember the firm, they, uh, uh, shut down their one of the artificial intelligence project, basically because uh, they, uh, like, they found that two artificial intelligence robots were basically communicating with each other in a language which they didn't process. I mean, the humans didn't process. Oh, so that's what you were trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's why I wanted some clarification. I wanted elaboration. Uh, which I think even I found interesting. You mean that they had developed a code? Yeah. Okay. A shortcut rather, which was not intended to be there. So they shut down the project, understanding that you know they started interacting each other, mm. uh, which is something which humans didn't want to, or the scientists didn't want to. Mm. So yeah, I think uh, what he's asking may be related to that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hello, uh, ma'am. I'm thinking about uh, Gandhi. Uh, you have talked about uh, 19th century information network, and I'm thinking about Gandhi with two examples. We have talked about Gandhi very uh, briefly in the last. Two sessions. That's right. Today, uh, yeah, today. yeah, yeah. Today, very briefly. But I'm thinking about Gandhi in the context of uh, that, uh, uh, as a journalist, as a, as a, he was doing lot of experiment with young India, mm -hmm. and uh, you have uh, because it was not a typical British uh, newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, everything was delayed with the young India also. As experiment, sometimes you find that some pages are blank. Uh, news are not coming on the same day. Mm -hmm. He's taking a lot of time for a single piece of news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also thinking about uh, Gandhi's idea of letter writing, which you have mentioned in the... Uh, right. And he was uh, a prolific letter writer. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> uh, recent, uh, because all, all those letters are not discovered. It will take almost 50 years, mm -hmm. because now now the first volume of that, those letters which are written to Gandhi is uh, come by Tridip Shirud and other uh, scholars. So and I'm especially mentioning uh, that, uh, uh, that book uh, which come almost three or uh, four years back, My Dear Bapu, which is edited by Gop uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi. And it's a precise conversation between uh, Sira Jagopalachari and Gandhi. And Gandhi is saying that, don't use telephone, uh, write letters. Mm -hmm. So, and Obviously, all those diaries by Parallel and Mahadev Desai, they're constantly saying that almost this man is writing almost 30 or 40 letters every day. So he, was, he used to write with the right hand, then he used to write with the left hand. So, and his whole ambition for the later writing, and uh, uh, somewhere uh, you have uh, said that to James Mill that the whole government of India is kept in writing. But Gandhi is looking writing in a very different way. So my precise question is that, how to place Gandhi in this 19th century information network? Mm. 
uh, if you, how, how do you see Gandhi in that 19th century information network? Well, you know, uh, you, talking about Gandhi in terms of letters and the newspaper, yeah. Young uh, you would be interested in this uh, recent study by a South African writer, her name is Isabel Hofmeyer, and she's written a book called Gandhi's Printing Press, oh, yeah. uh, and it's called yes. Experiments in Slow Reading, that's the subtitle, Experiments in Slow Reading, and you can see that she is, it's a take on his um, autobiography, you know, um, uh, the autobiography, Experiments in Truth, um, and her subtitle is, uh, for the book, Gandhi's Printing Press, Experiments in Slow Reading, and what she means by slow reading is that Gandhi had developed this very intricate theory of um, reading, uh, you know, that, um, you know, uh, you know, that the, um, that he was trying to do just the opposite of what modern technology is doing to our lives. You know, we're, everything is speeding up in our lives, right? It's about speed and it's about efficiency. And Gandhi was going the other way where he was trying to advocate a method of slow reading. So that, you know, the, any, and that's why the printing press, which was printing very slowly, you know, it wasn't necessarily the case that it was printing the news as it was coming out or as the news was being made. So that there's a gap between, um, you know, an event and when it gets printed or when it gets disseminated. And for Gandhi, that temporal gap is that uh, necessary space for the exertion of self-control and uh, self-discipline. You know, so that for Gandhi, this, you know, uh, when you said, uh, he said, don't telephone, uh, just write letters, it's the same principle that, you know, that letter writing which, which slows you down rather than picking up a phone or s shooting an email to somebody. That letter writing is a slower process, but it's also a process that is more intense for that same reason. And um, in Gandhi's entire philosophy of self-control was built on the premise that um, there has to be that moment of achieving what we have been calling in this course, dormant time. You know, that one has to sort of uh, set active time you know, that space of action where you're constantly doing things, but one in which everything is slowed down. And it's in that process of slowing down that Gandhi believed knowledge can best be absorbed. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, and this is of course part and parcel of Gandhi's entire philosophy. You know, he bemoaned the, uh, um, you know, the trains, right, because he said trains, um, uh, alienate people from within communities. He said that the, in the organic community, people used to produce goods for each other. And this is the nature of the organic community. But he said that with the trains, people were not producing for people within the community, they were producing pe for, uh, things for consumption in other communities far away that the train was enabling. So, you know, the whole point of Gandhi's was really towards that self-integration, uh, self-control, self-discipline, but the question of time was all important for him. It's about slowing down. Ma'am, Ma I have a question. I mean, this is about <coughs> the British modernity and education. Um, as we know, uh, the greatest leaders of Indian national movement, uh, whether that is Tagore, Nehru, Ambedkar, and Gandhi, they were actually benefited from British education and British modernity that the West gave us. And uh, how do you think that, uh, or uh, how is their uh, approach to modernity different from that of the British? And you mean how, what, whose how, modernity? How, Nehru's modernity? Uh, Nehru's modernity. Mm -hmm. and Nehru's, Ambedkar's, and even Gandhi's. Mm -hmm. Different from that of uh, the modernity which modernity ideas that British gave Nobody us. Nobody has purchased on the concept of modernity. You know, the British did not own it. They did not produce it. So, you know, the modernity is something that is being, um, um, you know, ap ap uh, appropriated and adapted to the purposes of, uh, of a society or, or a culture. So for Nehru to be educated in English and to absorb some of the tenets of British uh, or Western modernity, um, uh, did not m by any means mean that he could not adapt the, um, um, you know, the, you know, the, the education that he had. 
to the challenges of the time, to the requirements of the time. This was true in, in every case, you know, in Ambedkar's case in his own way. Perhaps Ambedkar was the most radical of all of them in, uh, in the sense that for Ambedkar, um, um, modernity was, um, you know, and he kept saying this again and again, that modernity was, um, uh, was very much dependent on an idea of um, access to culture, you know, that, the, that without access to culture, which he, by which he meant books, learning, uh, knowledge, you know, the totality of knowledge, um, there was no way that one could have um, um, access to modernity. So culture for Ambedkar was the means by which modernity um, uh, could be realized. And um, you know, for, for I mean, Gandhi's probably, you know, the, the idea of Gandhi's modernity is so qualified by his, um, um, by his uh, belief in the uh, integrity of the village, um, organic village community. That was Ambedkar's great quarrel with, uh, with Gandhi, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, according to Ambedkar, Gandhi's idea of the village simply perpetuated uh, existing caste norms and did not allow for any, um, uh, you know, movement away from those norms. So what for Gandhi was um, the, uh, the integrity of the society uh, and, the, and the kind of mutual reciprocity within that society was for Ambedkar, the very definition of caste. What Gandhi called mutual reciprocity was what Ambedkar called caste. So there's you know total um, you know a total disagreement between them. Uh, this is again regarding the interface that you talked about between uh, telepathy and uh, uh, telegram. Uh, you said that uh, 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 in a way this interface produces experiences of disembodiment and time-space comparison. Mm. Uh, how you think it? compels us to rethink the idea of territoriality that is uh, often most unquestionably associated with the idea of empire. Yeah, can you just repeat? It sounded like an important question, but I want to be sure I have it. Uh, 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 if you could just repeat yeah. it. When you talk about uh, 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 you know, technology and uh, uh, technological modes of communication and uh, uh, comparatively spectral modes of communication, the interface between the two. You say that uh, they produce the interface between the two, they produce uh, experiences of disembodiment, uh, uh, time space compression. Mm -hmm. uh, how you think, if that is what happening, how you think it compels us uh, to rethink the idea of territoriality that is often associated with, unquestionably associated rather, with the idea of empire? Territoriality associated with the idea of, uh, of empire. I'm trying to triangulate these three, you know, the technological, the occult, and the idea of, uh, of empire. And I, I'm, I may be missing something along the way in, in, your, in your formulation of this, but if territoriality can be assumed to be the um, um, opposite of time-space compression, as, uh, as I you know, use that term um, here, uh, territoriality imp um, implies that there are these finite boundaries and that there, you know, one can actually map um, you know, territory in a certain way, which is not similarly the case with um, you know, technological and, or occult um, uh, means. But then I'm missing something in, the, in, in this question that, um, it, where does ter why why territoriality? Tell me why territoriality. No, uh, when we think about empire, uh, empire British uh, colonial empire, there is always this sense that British dominating, e rather, rather West dominating the East. Mm -hmm. So in that term, there is a sense of very prominent sense of territoriality. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever uh, uh, we are we are trying to think or talk about empire, mm -hmm. so how you think uh, 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 this interface between these two? Uh, 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 technological modes of communication and comparatively spectral modes of communication mm -hmm. challenges this idea of territoriality that is often associated oh, with. Okay, I, I, uh, I understand your question now. I don't know if, if it can challenge, you know, I'm not suggesting that it would challenge the, um, you know, the idea of territoriality, but what I, what I think I am trying to suggest is that it is, let me, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. 
It's like um, the way that you know one form of um, communication, which depends on material means. You know that if we're going back to letter writing, you know, with Gandhi, or just let's talk about letters. That if one talks about letters, there's a material means of communication that requires the letter to be written by hand, the letter to be you know put in a uh, envelope, then sent to you know, to a center, postal center, and then, you know, by ship or air or whatever. So there's a mechanical process by which, um, you know, letters are, uh, are dispatched. You know, the, I could, instead of a technological and the cult, you can even say email. You know, because I think that example will work just as well as the, uh, as the other. Um, the email, on the contrary, um, completely obliterates that, uh, that notion of um, you know that length of time that it would take to send from one to the other, and in fact now you know we, there were, there were, I've heard the word soft copy, hard copy, uh, with the impression that soft copy being the uh, e-copy and the uh, hard copy being the printout. But the soft copy now actually has more authority. Even it's, at one point, the soft copy was seen as just a kind of um, a copy. That they, you know, the print is the real, and everything else is a simulation. But there's now, and even the idea that you know, the the um, the um, electronic copy has more um, authenticity because it cannot be um, uh, altered. You know, the print copy, someone can sneak in and change the signature, or change the date, or do something. Whereas with the electronic copy. You know, once an email, that the email has the date, the email has everything, you can't alter that. Uh, so there's a, there's a sense in which the um, electronic version, or the tech, what you can call the occult spectral version, has greater authenticity because it cannot be intercepted, altered, um, um, modified in any way, unlike the print copy. And that's the analogy that I would use to talk about territoriality, um, too. I'm not sure if it works very immediately, but it's a way of thinking about um, uh, you know, new kinds of power that are being um, uh, constructed in today's world. I mean, your question is an interesting one. I mean, I, I, I understand what you're, what you're asking, that you know, there was a physical empire that existed. Um, uh, you know, which reached its peak in the 19th century. But this is not to say that there isn't something similar in uh, today's world, where empire may not have territorial uh, equivalents, but it certainly can have an economic equivalence. When you talk about, you know, centers of economic power, you know, it could be, it's, it's probably Wall Street in today's uh, world. It doesn't matter who's U.S. president. It's the corporate sector in America that is actually dictating to the rest of the world. And it's in that sense that one could say that that is kind of yeah, extraterritoriality. Yeah, the reason I asked you this question is because uh, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, they, mm -hmm. Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, in the year 2000, uh, they talk about this idea of deterritorialized empire, mm -hmm. uh, where they are actually talking about how the uh, manifestation of empire in the present era uh, has changed yeah. because of the digitalization that is happening. Yes. Because uh, uh, they say that uh, uh, because of the pervasivity that, that digitalization uh, 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 has lent our life to, because of that it has become a lot more difficult for people to think of empire in terms of territoriality mm -hmm. uh, as we used to think of empire uh, when, when we think about British empire. So uh, they are seeing the uh, contemporary form considering the fact that it's deterritorialized, it has become a lot more difficult for people to identify uh, 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 who is uh, at the center of power. Mm. Uh, because exactly, because that power is so invisible. Yeah. I, I understand completely where you're going with this, you know, because it's so much easier to look at the sovereign consciousness of the British colonizer, you know, the governor general in Madras presidency or uh, Calcutta presidency, but it's much more difficult to ascertain, you know, who that sovereign consciousness uh, is when it's a kind of shadowy um, figure, you know, who's uh, kind of running the economic um, uh, nexus uh, of, of, uh, of power. But, you know, this idea of extraterritoriality is also something to, to think about. I have a colleague in my English department at Columbia, Matt Hart, who's been working on extraterritoriality. 
And he, and he has been describing um, extraterritoriality in terms of legal concepts. You know that, um, for instance, you know, uh, the waters, you know, there's a, there, um, if you are within um, certain waters, you know, around a country, and India, of course, being surrounded by so much water, that at what point um, um, does a ship that is in, you know, one water, one body of water rather than another, you know, sort of, in, you know, invasive of the territorial um, stretch of, uh, you know, of a country. And so this has legal, um, you know, legal meaning that, um, you, know, so, uh, you know, something that happens in uh, extraterritorial waters, the, the country that is immediately closest to it has no control over what happens. So there are all kinds of implications about um, territoriality and extraterritoriality.